Good morning. We're now on the record. Welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our consideration of H8, um, H818 um, regarding sexual exploitation of children. And uh, yesterday when we uh, adjourned, we were still speaking with um, one of our witnesses, Marshall Pauls from the attorney, um, I'm sorry, from the Defender General's office. And um, I had to unfortunately cut Marshall off. So why don't we, why don't we start with you, Marshall? You're available. Or oh, so I actually, um, I had a handout which I had sent to Mike Bailey not realizing. Um, so I just sent it to Mike F and maybe that will get up on the website soon. Um, but I don't really have much more to add to my testimony tomorrow uh, or yesterday. Besides <laughs> that, <laughs> tomorrow. Besides that, um, like I said, I would do, I put together just a really quick, uh, it was meant to be a two page, but it ended up being a three page um, section of some case law. What I ended up doing is taking case law from one case out of Texas, um, a case called Ex Parte Low, just because um, it, I think it's a good case because it walks, a lot of these First Amendment cases when appellate courts look at a First Amendment statute, they sort of, um, they skip through a lot of steps of the analysis. Uh, and the reason why I chose to use this case, ex parte low, isn't because it says anything exceptional or interesting, but just because it walks through every single step of the analysis and explains uh, why they're doing what they're doing and how it is different from, um, from reviewing other types of statutes. And I just see a chat from Mike saying that he did not receive it. So let me just pop onto my email, see why that happened. I have it as sent to the, to the right address, Mike. Um, I will check it again as soon as I'm done talking and maybe just resend it. Okay. You can, Marshall, you could also send it to House Judiciary. I don't know if that comes, it should be in your directory. Or if not, I can do that. If not, you can. If if that doesn't pop up for you, you can send it to me, and then I could send it to the committee. In the interim, um, oh, look at that. Martin, it's right in my email box. There you go. Okay. I just sent it. Okay, Martin, you had your hand up. Were you gonna? Oh, okay, you're all good. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, so I just sent it. So uh, if people want to take a look at it. I don't necessarily want to put it up on the screen and sort of walk through it because it's pretty lengthy um, and it really is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but it really just explains what I was talking about yesterday in terms of the presumptions in First Amendment cases being the opposite of the presumptions in all other cases and that facial overbreath really does uh, results in the invalidation of entire statutes if they cover too much territory that is protected speech. Um, and the other thing I would mention is just that in terms of, you know, the other thing I was going to do today was put together some suggested language. Uh, David Scher reached out to me and suggested that he and I should talk and try to come up with language together, um, possibly working with Michelle, and I think we are planning on doing that and talking about a time next week to meet. And so that's why I'm gonna hold off on any suggested language uh, because I think that probably between me and David and Michelle, we'll be able to come up with something. Well, thank you. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, any questions? To, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara and Tom. Um, thank you. So, Marshall, I was at like my lowest energy yesterday when you were passionately presenting. And so I want to make sure I fully understood what I took away was your worry about um, the constitutionality of this law, pretty much. But if I missed like another big theme that you had, and are concerned about, I'd love to hear that. 
just so really, you know, it boils down to the constitutionality of it. I mean, I don't think that from a policy perspective, there's anything, you know, it, it certainly makes sense that this would be conduct that would be treated with a criminal sanction of some kind. It fits right in with the rest of the statute. I think my point to it is, it's really twofold. One is that, you know, I have constitutional concerns about the language that we're using. And my particular concerns are that that could jeopardize not just this portion of the statute, but other portions of the statute as well. And that, you know, even outside of that sort of practical concern, just on a, you know, on a, as a matter of principle, um, this is a very serious felony with lifetime uh, consequences. And to my mind, when we are in the business of putting people behind bars for, you know, many, many years, talking decades, uh, we have a duty to do it right and to get it precise and to make sure that what we're doing is constitutional in every way we can. And honestly, to be pretty conservative about that because it's, you know, we're talking about some of the most serious offenses you can be charged with. Um, and so that's, that's my only, you know, apart from just the practical aspects of it, that's my only sort of principal point to it. And you weren't worried that we were gonna sweep more people in than should have been swept in? Well, I certainly worried about that at the beginning. I mean, you know, if you look back to the original version of this bill from last year, it would have criminalized owning the Sears catalog with, um, you know, lewd intent. It, it was so blatantly unconstitutional and went so far beyond the actual interests that we have in prosecuting this type of conduct and protecting the population that we're trying to protect here, um, that I had a lot of concern about that. And as this bill has worked its way, you know, both through that first year and then through this second sort of phase of revisions, um, I think we're to the point where it's now, it's now targeting exactly what it's meant to target. And it's just about making sure that the language we use to do that is sort of in keeping with what has been approved by federal courts, by the US Supreme Court in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Marshall, thank you for your work. Um, I think with this, I think especially with sex crimes that we need to be uh, 110% sure, that, you know, uh, when we're gonna, you know, start pointing fingers at people, um, you know, because if, if it happened, to, you know, the way I guess this is written there, and especially the, the way it was written last year, like you were talking about, there was that potential to, uh, um, you know, point the fingers at people that may not have broke the law. Um, and, and if they didn't, um, I mean, as everybody knows, if somebody is accused of a, of a sex crime, you know, in the public, they're guilty. And, and, and we certainly don't need to go down that road. And uh, I mean, this, this law, you know, it not only protects, you know, the victim in, in the way that we're discussing to change it, it's always, it's also going to protect, um, you know, the, the potential um, criminal, I guess you could say. But I, I just want to commend you, you and David for getting together, uh, you know, uh, and, and working on it and hammering out some language. Um, you know, through the years, I, I, I found out that some of our best legislation uh, comes when, you know, the, the, the concerned parties get together and, um, and, and work out the, the issues that we have. So thank you to both of you. Thank you. Uh, Martin. So Marshall, uh, thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm a little disappointed that you're going to be working with David because I really wanted to get deeply into constitutional issues with you this morning. <laughs> and, and now I'm not really going to get to uh, do that. I could, but it would be, you know, no reason to do that. But well, I, I it could be premature. Let's wait and see if me and David that's, actually. That's, yeah, that's what I mean. I I mean. But but I did want to put uh, throw a couple thoughts out there and and, and um, 
to make sure I understood where you were coming from. Uh, and I, I won't get too deep into this, but uh, as far as the overbreadth issue, um, I, I was wondering, and maybe this is going to be fixed be, uh, by uh, making it very clear that we're talking about an actual child when we are talking about simulation. Uh, and I understand where you were coming from uh, with that. Uh, but, I, you know, it does connect up to to the fact that the, the definition, um, the, the, the whole uh, chapter really deals with children and you would think it would be actual child. But I think once you say simulation, you kind of need to have that. So I agree with that. But with that, does that take care of your concern about the statutes over breadth being substantial? Can I reserve comment on that until okay. me and David have had time right. to talk? All right, so that, I, right. that, flag, that flag's an issue that I had, and, I, I, and so that's fine, that's fine. But I just, I, I guess this is more flagging a couple things uh, that kind of came up to me with, you don't have to answer them, but um, the, the, other, the other big issue was, you talked a lot about, about uh, the Williams case and intent and objective and subjective intent. And, and I really wanted to understand that a little bit better that because, and, and this is, I guess, as much for some of the new folks on, on the committee, that we, what we were presented is just one part of the definitions uh, for what we're dealing with uh, in, in this bill Thank and you. team. Uh, but it's, it's helpful to have actually, you know, I, I looked at the whole title 13, chapter 64, to understand the context of this, uh, of, of this change. And for those, when you get past the definitions, you know, when you get into the actual offenses, each of those have, have a scientor, uh, you know, have a, a state of mind requirement of knowledge, of intent, essentially. And it seems that that's where the intent language should be, not in the definition of what a simulation is or is not. And uh, you don't have to necessarily comment on that, but but just... Hey, well, I, I'll, I will throw out a comment. I agree with you. And I think that the point from Williams was that there's a, you know, the, su the Supreme Court highlighted an intent requirement that was specific to uh, the simulation, which makes it so that it would not necessarily be appropriate to be in the definition section, which applies across the board and really should only be in portions which have to do with simulation, which probably has a lot to do with why a lot of the other states that have laws about simulated uh, child pornography have it as a standalone law, not as part of the, uh, you know, their normal possession of child pornography statute. Um, but I think that probably me and David uh, we'll be able to put together something that that works one way or another and okay. hopefully doesn't require a whole new statute. Okay, yeah, all right, I appreciate that. Um, I guess I didn't quite read Williams the same way as you did, but I'll let you and David figure that out. So thank, thank you. And, and maybe next time we can get into it a little deeper on constitutional issues. Sounds good. Any other questions for Marshall? I'm not, I'm not seeing any other hands. Make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay. Um, if not, Marshall, if you, are you all set? Because I'll, I'll turn to, uh, I'll turn to David now. Anything yeah, else? Thank you very okay. much. Great. Okay. David, good morning. Good morning. Um, thanks to the committee for uh, their consideration on this bill and, um, you know, I have I have mostly good news for you, which is that although I think Marshall and I will remain uh, uh, far apart on some of our read of the case law, I do think that the um, changes that the Def Gen is concerned about are ones that we'll be able to uh, figure out and come to an agreement on. Um, you know, our, our our read of the law is is different. I mean, I think that the uh, the current way that the statute defines child is a very typical way that statutes work. We have definite, we often have definition sections at the beginning of a statutory chapter. Um, and then the 
way that that a, a particular word is defined uh, holds throughout the chapter. So anytime you see the word, um, it is defined the way the definition section says it is. Um, and again, that, that seems typical to me. And I think the definition we have that child means any person under 16 years of age is clear that we couldn't be talking about simulations or um, think, you know, things that are not persons who are under 16. That being said, I think we can um, you know, uh, hew as closely as possible to the um, constitutional precedents and, um, and just like close off any possible doubt there and we're, we're fine to work on that. Um, the issue around the intent, uh, again, my read of it is that the current intent language is sort of typical intent language that makes, that ensures that the person has to have meant to, to have possession of that which is unlawful to have. But again, uh, happy to like close the loop there and make sure that we, uh, are being very clear and uh, so clear in a way that will um, both satisfy the defender general, but also, you know, on our side, we want to make sure that we're not writing in an intent standard that's so high that it is outside the normal standards that we would use for describing criminal conduct or um, saying that conduct is criminal. So I, I do think that that's an area where our office and the defender general will be able to work together to, uh, to, con to, come to agreement on that. Um, but just a couple other points that I wanted to make, and, and you know, Marshall and I could clearly have a hour long appellate argument on this and who knows, maybe we will someday. But uh, so I don't wanna belabor some of the disagreement because I, again, I think we'll be able to uh, come to an agreement on the key points. I, but I did just wanna say in terms of the potential overbreath challenge, which is a, a constitutional challenge that would uh, say that because a law encompasses too much um, speech that is protected by the First Amendment, it is therefore overbroad and needs to be struck down. And Marshall's concern was that this could be subject to an overbreath challenge, and as a result, the entirety of the um, child sexual abuse statutes could be struck down. I don't read the laws the same way in terms of what the danger is there. I think that. Um, two things. I, I don't think that it would be subject to an overbreath challenge, and that's our sort of fundamental disagreement. But a secondary disagreement or, or area where we see the law differently is, is how a court would deal with that if it did. And we, again, I don't think we need to go into this in great detail, but there's something called a doctrine of severability. And my read of this is that it would be very easy for a court, and a court would, in fact, uh, just excise the piece of the law that is creating the overbreath challenge. And it would be very easy for them to do that because it's its its own little section that we are proposing in this bill. And they could easily just take that out and say the rest of the law uh, stands and is operable without that section. And that would be, I think, a typical um, way of analyzing this, the way courts normally analyze overbreath, or I should say, yeah, overbreath challenges in the severability doctrine. So I, I don't share that fear uh, or that concern. I, I think we the, the statutes are gonna be fine as a matter of like, even if there were to be a constitutional problem. And again, my underlying or underlying uh, disagreement is, is whether there even is a danger. And, and we just, the way the statute's drafted now, uh, we don't think there is. Obviously, Marshall and I read the Ferber case very differently, which is that underlying, the, the sort of original case that lays out um, the Supreme Court's doctrine on child pornography um, and pulls it out of protected speech generally. Um, you know, Ferber actually was decided on an overbreath, overbreath uh, doctrine. They, they, they say in, in Ferber, and I can just read one sentence really quickly. The court says, applying these principles, and when they say these principles, the court was talking First Amendment principles. They say, applying these principles, we hold that the relevant statutory section is not substantially overbroad. So Ferber, as like the core of what it's doing, it's not just extra verbiage that it's thrown in there as speculation about what might what the law might be. They're saying our holding is that 
Uh, we are looking at the whole expansive sweep of this law, and uh, we're not just looking at the particular circumstances of the case that uh, that brought Ferber uh, to court, that the prosecutors charged Ferber with. Um, and we're saying, looking at the whole expansive sweep, this is not overbroad. And in order to do that, they had to, they necessarily had to, and, and that our reading that they did look at uh, all possible uses of the law, including the simulation aspect of it, which was necessarily a part of the section that they were reviewing. Um, and again, that you know, when you're doing an overbreath challenge, a court looks at everything. And so I, I believe that they had to look at that. I believe that the text shows that they did look at that and consider that, the simulated aspect of it. Um, and that's just the logic of a of an overbreath challenge is we let's look at the whole sweep, see if there's too much that's caught up in it. Ferber decides it's not. Uh, again, that's an area where the Defender General and I uh, disagree on, on the law. Um, but we think that because of that, we are in very safe territory because the statute we're proposing is very similar to the uh, Ferber statute. Uh, the Defender General brought up the point that there could be differences in the way we are proposing that this law would be structured that makes it more vulnerable to appeal than the similar statutes in other cases. Again, my reading of the of the other states' laws is that we're all doing it very similar. We set similarly, we set out a definition in a definition section that includes that now our proposal would be that now it includes simulated as part of the definition. And then in other sections you apply that, you write the statute that actually criminalizes certain behavior, uh, relying on the definition section to clarify exactly what it is that is being outlawed. And uh, I, you know we're, we're following the same formula, I think, that most of the other states follow. And so I don't see us as being in uniquely um, concerning territory constitutionally. So again, I think that um, the Defender General and I could have very long and, and interesting argument, maybe teach a class someday about this stuff. But, uh, and, but I think that we are going to be, the, the actual areas of, of language disagreement, textual disagreement are uh, relatively narrow. And I think we'll be able to find our way through those. So I, we look, I look forward to bringing that back to the committee. Great, well, I, I certainly, Appreciate that, and I uh, echo uh, Representative Burdett's comments that often some of the the best work uh, that gets produced is when when parties, uh, stakeholders do work together. And and for um, new members, often I will send people off to the cafeteria, and uh, you know, or out into the hall, or something like that. And uh, and just with a little time and patience, things often do get um, narrowed down, or or perhaps really you know worked out and. Um, in full, so I, I do do appreciate uh, both um, Attorney General's office and Defender General's office in, in your in your efforts. Uh, so, committee members, I realize there's a lot of legal terms flying around, and if anybody would like just some clarity or review, we've heard sever severability. You would say it. Um, what else? Over breath. Uh, all all sorts of things. So. We have Michelle here who could could review some of those terms or or, or do a just a general summary or or overview of the concepts that what we've been hearing and what is in consideration. Would that would that be helpful for people? I see. Yes. Okay. Um, and okay. So, so Bob, just you raising your hand means yes, we absolutely <laughs> will do that, and I appreciate you you stepping up, uh, Martin. Yeah, I, actually, if and if Michelle can start with the concept of well, I use the fancy term scienter, but the state of mind necessary in criminal law, because I think that's something we're going to run into again and again. Uh, so that would be helpful if she could start with that. Um, putting you on the spot, Michelle, but <laughs> but. And uh, certainly if you want to take a, a break for a few minutes to kind of collect your, your thoughts, but. Uh, well, I would, I would, uh, I'm happy to chime in. Um, you know,
know, the, the, the two witnesses deal with a lot of this stuff much more often than I do. So I'm just going to go a little bit off the cuff here. So in talking what Martin's talking about, uh, mens rea, mental state of the person's intent, is that um, is when you think about it and you think about the different criminal laws, um, an, an important, uh, an essential element there is what is the intent of the actor? And then there's levels of, of intent um, that within that are used within the statute. So um, what you want to know is, so if you think about, um, let me think about something that people probably think of in the, you know, if you watch a crime drama or something like that, and you think about uh, um, like first degree murder. So everybody kind of has heard that term or things like that is, and we're talking about there's different levels. So something like that would be premeditated or intentional. So there was like, like a clear intent to commit the act. On the other spectrum, on the other side of that, you might have something like negligence. So it would be that the, there, it wasn't an intentional act that the person took, but through their negligent, was, negligence was their uh, state of mind with, with regard to the act that would subjected them to the criminal offense. And there's, I can, what I can do is I think I have an old, um, thing that I did years ago for Judiciary Magazine, you might remember, is I did like a, a glossary. Do you remember that? It's probably like 15 years old or something. And um, and I bet it's probably in our docs management system and I can pull that up and send it to y'all. That might be helpful. And so it'll go over some of those terms that we use in here, you know, uh, fairly often. And, um, and we can talk about those things. So, um, so I think, you know, the, the intent issue obviously comes into the thing is about with, with the child sexual abuse materials, because it's, you know, everybody's very concerned, understandably making sure that someone um, who isn't charged with one of these, these offenses through mistake, or, you know, they weren't intending to download the information or be in possession of that information. And so intent really does come up as a, as a very important issue within these particular types of crimes. And so let me look for that document and then I can do that. You can also, I can probably pull the jury instructions um, that Vermont has with regard to the, uh, the intent and so it can kind of give a bit of a, a more built out description of the of the intent that we use here in Vermont. Um, so you also mentioned severability. And I think uh, both of the witnesses have been talking about that. There's the doctrine of severability, meaning uh, essentially that uh, the court should only invalidate the unconstitutional portions of a law rather than bringing the whole thing down and leaving uh, so Generally, there's there's that, but also I think I just sent you guys the citation for what we have in statute in Title I. So there is a severability, just generally applicable statute that we have in Vermont law. Sometimes you'll see legislation in Vermont that will have its own severability clause. And I always kind of wonder why that's in there sometimes because we have the Title I provision, but Sometimes people just like to see it on the page for reassurance, um, but that's the issue of severability. Um, then on the overbreadth issue is, uh, you know, I can't really talk, it's been, I think, you know, I haven't dealt with this in a while, but you know, that's generally what everybody's been talking about, which is that you wanna make sure that when you're talking about creating a criminal statute that implicates speech, that you're not sweeping in um, a bunch of constitutionally protected speech. You want to be making sure that it's narrowly targeted right at that particular conduct that you want to prohibit, that you have a valid basis to be able to prohibit because it's not constitutionally protected, um, because there are there's a, co a compelling state interest as to why you have to make some infringements, things like that. And so the overbreath is just making sure that, you know, we're trying to do the the good work that you want to do that you're not unintentionally bringing in and affecting um, other areas that are protected. So Great. is that helpful? Thank you so much. Yeah, is that um, questions? Anybody? And certainly if uh, Professor Sher and Paul's want to weigh in on uh... Yeah, weigh in. <laughs>
Just looking for a hands committee members if uh Bob, was that helpful to you? Okay. Felicia, I think you know some of this, but oh, everybody's good. Can um, I also comment that sure. I don't like uh, I don't like crimes that have negligence as the uh, mens rea. <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of those, but uh, right. no. Okay. And also, uh, anyone is always free. You know, if you want to email me, set up a time to talk, ask me for some resources and stuff. I'm always available for for stuff like that. If you don't want to take up committee time. Um, always happy to sit down and chat with any of, of you about any of this stuff. And I'll give an endorsement that it's really, it's been really helpful when I have um, reached out to Michelle. So I highly recommend it. Okay. All right. So I think we will pause on uh, H18. Uh, I think it'd be helpful to, to see what happens after um, Defender General's Office and Attorney General's Office meet with Michelle. Hopefully you will do that. I know Monday's a holiday. Hopefully you will do that earlier in the week because I would like to, to get back to this uh, Wednesday and Thursday. We're still working on the agenda, but um, it'd be good to have, um, if that's possible, uh, to get back to this and see where we're headed because I know this is a important bill, um, especially to our lead sponsor, uh, and avert it. So, all right. Well, great. Well, thank you, uh, David Marshall and, uh, and Michelle. And then uh, we don't have anything else scheduled this morning, but committee, let's just take some time to talk about the week, how it went, uh, what we're looking to do ahead. Um, Michelle, I think we're all, all set with, with you. If you, I'm sure you have other things that you need to do well i can multitask is it i was thinking maybe if you're talking about planning i might just kind of stay on and listen okay sure absolutely sure. so um so so far committee we are we're going to take up this bill h18 we're going to go back to um h20 which was the pretrial services uh that we looked at yesterday and hear from um judge grierson eric uh the witnesses that we heard from Yesterday, so uh, the Attorney General's office, um, the Defender General's office. I'm going to um, hold off on the Department of Corrections um, at this point because I think um, I, I, I'm hoping that things will become illuminated <laughs> and clearer uh, when we when we go back uh, to the witnesses and and to Eric uh, from from yesterday and and. Uh, and move on from there. Uh, the other thing we talked about is when we heard from Judge Zones, the chair of the Sentencing Commission, and he mentioned that the Sentencing Commission is going to expire in less than a year. It's going to sunset. That's another term that we use around here quite a bit. Um, and what a sunset, often we'll put in sunsets when we pass something saying, you know, let's Let's come back. Let's come back in a year or two. Let's send, you know, in a year or two, let's come back and, and visit this to make sure if this is still working, if there's anything else we need to do. And so, um, so that's called a, a sunset. And uh, we can either eliminate the sunsets and have whatever the law is or the commission or whatever continue um, without a yearly or, um, you know, every two year review. Um, or we can extend it so we do continue to come back. Um, so that's something that I that I would like to look at. And we talked about doing it as a committee bill because I thought that would be an interesting um, exercise and learning experience for us. But a committee bill is something that where we, the Judiciary Committee, become the sponsors of the bill. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the Sentencing Commission um, sunset is something that we we will all agree on and that shouldn't be too too complicated. So so that's what I have. Um, I see Tom, go ahead. Yeah, just something that came to mind as you were speaking about the sunset laws. And uh, I, I, I see a similarity between that and session law in that they uh, potentially, I mean, the sunset law is potentially coming to an end, but the session law 
a, a lot does come to an end and maybe you could just touch on that a little bit. In terms of what session law yeah, is? As far as the session law and just the, I guess the difference between them. Okay, so Michelle, this is where I may need you, but my understanding of session law is that it doesn't go in the green books. That's not a very, that's not a very good explanation, but it's, um, it's sort of the reasoning. It might be legislative intent, uh, but there's probably a rule. There's probably a rule with legislative council as to what does or doesn't go into session law. So I would rather defer to to Michelle if she's available, unless unless there's another member that knows the answer. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot it's, like it's that. Fine. <laughs> I think Michelle is multitasking. Um, that would be my guess, which is fine. I mean, we can certainly touch do you on know? it. Do you know what? I mean, you know, it's usually like statements of purpose, intent, things like that. So after six years, I still don't know exactly what the difference is. So I'm eager to hear what Michelle tells us. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's, you see, so for new members, it doesn't matter how long you've been here. <laughs> lots of things we don't know and lots of things to still learn. So... Okay, the, um, I'm trying to think if I'm, so the other thing that, um, that we were looking at in terms of a, a agenda, so it came up the um, preamble to the criminal code or some sort of, I'm still ambiguous as to where this would go, but um, one of the things I was thinking about is some sort of um, session as a committee where we, we go back and say, okay, We've heard this testimony. We've met a number of the justice system players. What do we think the purpose of the justice system is? And do something like we've done in the past. Um, and I'm sorry, Selena isn't here, but I would I don't see her, right? Um, but she has been great at being our, um, our note taker and our scribe in terms of using whiteboard and really putting up there just what our thoughts are not you know it's not about right answers wrong answers but it, it's helpful to do that type of exercise and I will um, send you Mike found we did it um, we did it twice uh, the first time we did sort of a more of a kind of a mission statement and then actually Ken I think um, it, this came from um, some of your questions where we looked at what is what is the role of the Judiciary Committee and that was another thing where we just put things up on the board and it was it was helpful because it, it I felt it, it grounded us it summarized things that we had heard and um, there are often times when we were asked to look at something and I would say nope it's not in our lane and I would point to the whiteboard and I would say you know this is our role that's not up there that's institution's role. So I, I welcome Ken or, or others to, to chime in about that process and whether something like that would interest you. I know it's a bit, bit vague. <laughs> um, and also um, in terms of, if anybody also can add more clarity in terms of the preamble that either Judge Zonis was talking about or Bobby Sand, um, that'd be helpful too. Um, Tom, your hand went, are you? No, I put it down. Okay. Um, Ken, do you do you remember the that exercise we did in terms of the role of the Judiciary Committee? Can't hear you. I can't. Let me un see if I can. There goes the hand up, and I just put it down. I just uh, right now it, it it's. Um, in case you haven't noticed, I'm just sitting here kind of staring intently because of the, the couple of things that we've done already are, are um, just trying to understand the, the basics, where things come from, how things develop where they are. The starting point to anybody that has no idea of the judicial system, and maybe I'm the uh, least least knowledgeable person here because I just have the what I would what I would uh, use as a, as a common sense approach, but that's not how things get done here. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It just it's just I would just 
go for it to get stuff done and then tweak it as it goes, moves forward and the lawyers just tear it apart. So going back to the whiteboard, I actually think that I still have that on my phone somewhere of what we wrote down because I, I thought that was interesting. And um, I, I think this committee for me personally, like right now today, like I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with uh, um, for this child, child thing just really, really, really bothers me immensely. Um, um, and it's just trying to keep it so I can understand it and then learn as we go. And then, um, you know, when you go and you hear uh, David and Marshall going back and forth on it, it's like, okay, so I'm just sitting here not saying anything. And, and trying to learn from that. I don't know if I just made any sense, but that's where I am. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you, no you, you didn't make sense. Is there, what would be helpful in terms of the um, um, H18 um, that we're working on, the child abuse, child sexual exploitation, um, what would be helpful for you to, do you need, do you want to meet with Michelle? Do you, um, I think just hear, hear more, I think a lot of times just sitting and listening and learning and watching where people are coming from and, you know, the, the professionals go at it and then um, uh, I, I think with me it's just, it's just a lot of, um, my common sense and how I look at things and how I make decisions, you know? It's what I've always done. I, I you know, I'm kind, I'm kind of lucky in, 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 in most ways. I've never needed or used uh, lawyers a lot. So, um, you know, it's like when I first came in judicial, it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, this is an over, this is an overwhelming um, committee, but also very satisfying in, in what we do. God, I can't believe I just admitted that. I'm done. Okay. Well, again, so our, our role is to listen to the witnesses and they are subject matter witnesses. So in this case, we have the attorney general and and the Defender General's Office. And, and then we also have counsel who is um, nonpartisan, does not take a side, but does, um, as our attorneys, explain the law to us. And then, and then in the end, it's up to us to decide, you know, whether or not it's good policy. Um, and, and, you know, based on the testimony um, and legal counsel that, that we've received. Um, and yeah, and I think that was one of the things. It's just like when I when I said about uh, uh, the judge. It's like what I was really looking for was past practice of of what's you know what's what's happened in 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 the courts to learn by that. And then it, it's like obviously that's where you know you got to go and use who is available to you, um, the the profession, you know Michelle and stuff like that that we've done, and then. Uh, where uh, David's coming from and where uh, Marshall's coming from. And, and then um, I assume at some point we'll probably have Rory in here for um, speaking on, on stuff on, on Washington County, but it's just a lot, a lot going on with this. It is a lot. No, we are a busy committee and we, we did jump in. <laughs> because that tends to be my style. Um, so I, Kate, I see your, oh, Barbara, I'm sorry, I don't know who raised their, their hand um, first, but, uh, and I also wanted to say that, um, so Martin sent me the role of the judici judiciary and um, also Mike yesterday sent me the other one. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out what we did on the whiteboard. I'm trying to figure out how, how we can either screen share or get it back maybe email it to everybody in the committee. Um, 
Welcome, Selena. I see that you've joined. We're talking I, about doing some more sort of committee thinking, visioning, defining. Um, this is a follow up to both, um, good morning, both Bobby Sand and um, uh, Judge Zone is talking about some sort of preamble or, or, or something like that. But we had talked about you know, the justice system, thoughts on the justice system. So that's, that's where we are. And we're also talking about um, next week and what we'll do next. Um, so, um, and I gave you lots of kudos for your, <laughs> for your oh, role. Okay. Sorry to be a little late. No, no, no. I, I, you I, an I intern. Yeah, yeah, so, so good to see you. Um, so how about Kate and then Barbara? Yeah, I just had a, I just had a comment. Um, just wanted to say that I would really appreciate that kind of exercise. I feel like just generally for me, anytime I work with a group, certainly a group like this that has such such important intent, it's really helpful to ground myself in a mission or a vision. And, you know, I think particularly with the work that we're doing, it's so complex in terms of trying to thread this needle of, you know, we want to, we want to protect the most vulnerable, but in our judicial system, the most vulnerable is sitting on both sides of the courtroom. And so how do, how do we honor that? And I think having some definitions for me and some guardrails and some things to sort of ground myself in are really helpful as I'm listening to testimony and sort of thinking about, you know, where we're headed at any given moment. Right. So, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And, and yeah, and we can, I, we certainly can build off of this one, but I actually would love a clean slate because we're a new committee. <laughs> um, you know, we, or we could put this to the side or something, but I don't, I, I really want it to come from us, you know, um, because, because we are a new committee and, and our new members bring, um, bring new things to the committee. And, and also I think, um, you know, those of us who as with each year, you know, we learn more and do more, I think it's um, helpful. So, but it is, it is great to have this. It's also, um, the other one was the mission statement and that was, um, or sort of a timeline looking at um, all the different points where a person might um, come in contact with the um, justice system, which, I think is also helpful because often we we start from arrest or or a police stop or something like that and, and we're learning in terms of off ramps that there's it's 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 really a much longer continuum. Um, Barbara. So I um, am actually um, trying to build on Maxine what you and Kate have just talked about. It seems like if as a group we could articulate and where we have agreement, put those in one spot and where other principles are really important to people, but we don't have agreement, like put those in another spot. But like, what is our vision for what the judicial system and other areas that we have jurisdiction over should look like? Like, like people should get their, um, business done quickly or so things that more, more than identifying the problems like sort of looking at what what we all value so that we have sort of a lens to use as we're looking at bills like how does this fit in with the principles we all just agreed are so important um, it reminds me a little bit of being on jury duty and having the jury um you know, the judges or not his orders, but the jury guidelines or whatever, just so as we get into the thick of things, again, we can look at what the premises were that we see so as so valuable. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, yeah, so I asked people to be thinking about it and Oh, somebody's trying to get into the got it, my waiting room. Okay. Um, yeah, um, and and um, Selena also, I wanted to ask if if you could perhaps take a take a lead on this as well because you're 
you're so helpful and you're so good at this in terms of, and this would be next, you know, we do this next week. So we can think about it over the weekend and early next week. Uh, but I do think that, I do think that it would be helpful. And Barbara, I like your idea of things that we don't agree on because I, I know, I think we'll, we'll put up there, you know, deterrence, punishment, you know, there'll be things where I think people do disagree or feel like we need more research or, or, or whatever, but, but are still, but it's still important to have, have that all up there as, as well. Um, Martin. Uh, very much a technical question and, and probably for Selena as much as anything. Selena, have you, do you have a, one of those whiteboard apps like Trello? Have you heard of Trello? Um, yes, I am a Trello okay, user. Right. So that could, that's an interesting thought. We could use that and just do some share screen. There is a whiteboard functionality in um, Zoom. I haven't used it, but I, I looked into it last session when we were sort of talking about maybe doing some group brainstorming. So there's that also that option, but Trello is certainly like a much more visual you know. Yeah, if you know how to use it, just to share a screen and have your screen up, that that might be that technical part of it. Because yeah, I've used it some as well, and it it really is a, a good visual tool. It is it is yeah, I like that. I like that approach, Martin. That's a good idea. And yeah, I'm happy to to help sort of do you know note taking and and uh, whatever degree of facilitation or co facilitation to help with that. Sure. Yeah, and also uh, possibly framing the prompt or the, or the prompts too would be helpful. Um, Coach. Thank you. Um, Selena, we, we, we uh, were talking about you as we were uh, planning uh, in a good way. <laughs> uh, and that whole discussion uh, about the technical aspects uh, you know, did come up uh, because we are visual uh, people. And uh, as learners, that's uh, really important. We, we've used both tools uh, in a number of different uh, uh, activities that we've done. And it, it is just so, uh, you know, as we're getting used to the platforms that we're using, uh, it's nice to be able to have that. But uh, thanks for agreeing to help us through this part of the process because you do it so well oh thanks yeah of course it'll be team effort like all the good things great thank you thank you coach so much thank you and let's see um coach do you have something else or see so your your hand is still no okay um so as can somebody refresh my memory or make a distinction be, if there is one between what Bobby Sand was saying in terms of a preamble or a, um, you know, versus what Judge Zonis was talking about. I'm still trying to, somebody have that in there. I see Selena. Yeah, thank you. I'm not I'm quite talking. sure what Judge Zone was Zone's suggestion was, but I know that Bobby was specifically, I think, suggested really looking at like, is it time to write, a, and even if it's just a hypothetical one, a preamble to the whole criminal code, essentially, although we sort of don't quite have a criminal code the way that some states do, but that was how I understood that, but I'm not, I'm not I don't know. I'm not quite sure what Judge Zone was suggesting. So, okay. I, yeah, yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, sure, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to go to Martin. I see other hands. I'm going to go to Martin because of this, because um, because the sentencing commission, and then I'll go to Coach and Kate. Um, I mean, this has been part of the effort. Of, we're trying to get to the point of having, uh, like, following the model penal code in our own special way. And that was what H580 was and what the Sentencing Commission is working towards. So you're right, Selena, we don't really have that right now, but that's kind of the end goal. And, and I would think uh, just uh, maybe the Sentencing Commission should ponder or look at 
whether there is something like this that the model penal code or other states that have uh, real criminal codes, if they have these kind of preambles, uh, that may be something to work on or to, to look at. Um, we don't really have a, I mean, maybe that's even something to have Eric take a look at for a possibility for, for a bill coming out of here. Okay, thank you. So that's helpful. And I, what I was envisioning in terms of the exercise that we were talking about is something that is way before we even get to a preamble to the to the criminal code. Um, so, okay, great. So um, Coach and Kate or however, sorry if I'm going out of order. That's fine. Uh, the, um, I, I think Selena and Martin both capsulized uh, the thought uh, very well. Um, I think for us, you know, we can start at whatever juncture, you know, we'd like, you know, I think as a, as a committee, as far as that discussion, because it's new, you know, we don't have one. Uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, and the code doesn't exist. I think Martin's point about that's, you know, why the commission uh, and some of the work of the commission is so valuable, uh, because we're trying to bring uh, this new entity into to life, so to speak. Uh, so, so that being said, we have a number of resources. One of the things that came up uh, in that discussion is, you know, continuing, you know, the uh, commission, uh, you know, and their work uh, in general. Uh, you know, not like it's the never ending story, but um, they did kind of, uh, or at least Judge Zone uh, uh, shared his interest in, you know, getting more work done, you know, around the codes. Uh, so uh, that's kind of an offer in a way to work towards uh, an end of some sort. Uh, and then we just got a, a request from uh, UVM uh, for research process, uh, you know, work as well. So, I mean, there's a number of uh, resources that we could avail ourselves of, you know, even there, even a short question, you know, what are the other states doing, you know, something to that effect. But just the thought. Thank you. Kate. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess just had a, some clarifying questions, like these are the aspects of, of the judicial system I get confused by. It seems like, you know, there's like so many lanes and avenues of law. And so when you're talking about criminal code and the sentencing commission or the group that's working on that, um, I think I'm probably 100% of the time gonna come down on the side of like, we should ground ourselves in values always and name those. Um, but just curious to get a little bit of definition or background around like what is it what's the specific significance of a preamble for that particular sort of like lane of law okay so generally and actually i see michelle has to go in a few minutes and it's sort of a good segue to session law versus what's in the green books but um preamble could be legislative intent you know what what we're thinking what the purpose is of the um, of the model penal code, you know, if, we're, if we go that way or of a law so that people who are reading the law can look to that to understand or courts can look to that to understand what the legislative intent was, why we, why we passed it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I'm gonna, be so, because Michelle is, needs to go, um, Michelle, I couldn't really, answer other than saying session law is stuff that doesn't go in the green books <laughs> right. <laughs> right. like legislative intent and purpose but that was not a very clear right so you're <laughs> just wondering we, so you know we're all here um on our zoom you know right. in our square so we don't have the green books behind us like we normally right. do so. yes i know i keep uh, i don't go into the office very often but sometimes when i do i seem to be slowly one by one pilfering all my green books off the off the shelf because um, 
because it's nice something uh, that you have there is you have all the case notes and all of that kind of stuff that's in there. And you can sometimes it's just really nice to be flipping through a book instead of looking online all the time. Um, but the difference between uh, session law and what you put in statute is that there are some things that you want to have in legislation and session law has the same force of law as what you put in statute. So it doesn't have a lesser standard of adherence or anything like that. Um, but there are some things that just don't really make sense to put in the books that will be there for years and years and years. Um, and so examples of that are, you'll see that lots like with um, always with or almost always with money provisions with appropriations right so if you so um the so if you if you think about the budget right and every every year there's a budget you know you don't want to have books of budgets every year with it, things that are in statute these are things that are ha are important for a certain moment in time um and uh but they don't necessarily need to stay in there for people to be looking looking up. So we use session law that's at the discretion of the attorney who's drafting it. But you know sometimes you know it is is always up to you guys. So sometimes we may put in session law a, a, a purpose or intent, and then it would appear not on in, it will appear in the section in the statutory section, but it'll appear in the notes in the bottom rather than up above. Sometimes it's really important to legislators and they say, no, we want it codified. We want it right up front there mm -hmm. um, for them to see, for, for folks to see. And that's, you know, we don't tend to care about that. That can be a judgment call for you. But when we're drafting, we usually try, we make the initial call about stuff like that. Sometimes there will be findings and some people and some committees really love findings, kind of setting up their argument for why they are going to, why they are passing this legislation. Um, uh, you know, from from our office's standpoint, you know, we're not necessarily huge fans of 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 findings. We and we find we usually recommend that those be in session law. Because sometimes you know it just goes on and on uh, with a long list of these are all the reasons why we think this is a good idea and it's you can totally do that but I think generally that kind of stuff is good for session law and not necessarily needs to be codified so it is available um, it, there you put stuff in there sometimes with intent and purpose to make sure so if they're the tricky language issues and you want to make absolutely clear and plain language that you guys are responding perhaps to a Vermont Supreme Court decision. Sometimes that happens is the court interprets something and they say, oh, this is kind of vague. We're going to interpret it this way. And, and you guys next door say, ah, oh, that's actually not what we meant, you know, and you want to go back. And so sometimes you'll put it in session law up front in the bill and say, you know, in response to this particular decision, we are making this change and our intent is this. Um, so session law, important, and you'll see it all the time uh, in legislation, but it, it's just a kind of a value judgment about whether or not it really needs to be part of the actual statute. We uh, so is that, you know, is that helpful? Yeah. So we do study committees in session law. Again, that's something, unless it's a committee, an oversight committee or a study committee that's gonna be going on for a long time. But if you have one in shortened duration, you know, we put it in session law. So the committee is created, it's gonna exist for a year or two, they have a reporting requirement, and then it disappears. And so it may appear um, for a little while and then it's just gone. And so what we do during uh, the summers or this year, we crammed into November and December is the, all the attorneys in our office, we are, uh, we work with LexisNexis and we're essentially the editors of the green books. And so uh, we work with our publisher. They take all the legislation that passes each year they incorporate it into these um, draft updates of all the green books and then they send those proofs to our office and then 
We all take different titles and we review them. We review the language to make sure that the language was incorporated properly. We review the notes and all of those types of things. And so, um, so we're kind of keeping an eye and making sure that if there was session law, you know, lots of times the question from LexisNexis will be, do you want this in the notes or not? Like, is it important, you know, so, and then we make a judgment call about whether or not, you know, we think it's helpful for the reader who's gonna open the book. Do they need to see that language or is it just some study committee that, you know, is not really gonna, not, not that study committees aren't important, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter for general interpretation of the statute. Thank you, and Michelle, do you happen to have a green book any, any just one green book because we're talking about it. I'm not sure that everybody knows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just a prop. <laughs> Doesn't matter what title, but. Um, I know, I was looking to grab my title 13, but it's actually under my iPad in which I'm talking to you right now. We all have right. this, right? Right. I'm sure I'm probably not the only one with stacks of books to, with all right. my devices. <laughs> right, right. So uh, these, and um Usually what Maxine has us do, what has one of like either me or Brent or Eric is come in at the beginning of the biennium and we just kind of walk through these a little bit and look at them and, and talk about how to, uh, how to use them. Um, and you can, you can get all of the statutes online. Do you want me to talk about this for a minute? Or, um, or sure, sure, yeah. Or but you can you they're all available online, the statute. So you have access to all of that. Um, and what you don't get are all the notes under it, and those are just in the books. Um, so uh, so um, I, I prefer to use the green books if I if I can. But um, but like I sent you the link to the severability statute earlier and all of that stuff is is on there and I would encourage you for the new folks you know go online I think our website is really great I you know I have access to everything I need through our document management system things like that but I honestly I, I go off most often to the website because it's so easy to navigate and look up the statutes and have different windows open and looking at the different definitions and things like that and so if you go on there and you can buzz around. We typically work in this committee works in Title IV, which is the judiciary title. Um, so the, the titles are organized by subject matter. There's 33 titles. Um, judiciary is Title IV. Um, you also work in Title 12, which is court procedure, Title 13, which is crimes and criminal law, Title 14, which is estates probate law. 15, 15A, 15B, 15C is all family law. So what you have, uh, you know, Title 15 is domestic relations. So that's marriage, divorce, child custody, stuff like that. 15A is adoption. 15B is an interstate compact, I think. Um, I would have to say I haven't ever worked on 15B in the 20 plus years I've been here, so I can't even remember. And then 15C is actually your latest title that this committee worked really long and hard on um, a few years back on creating a brand new title just addressing the issue of parentage. Um, and so that was a, a fun thing to work on, updating the parentage laws to be recognizing the you know, changing nature of families today um, because we had really some super old stuff on the books that didn't remotely reflect what's happening with families today. And so you have that one, um, 1916. Uh, you also work sometimes in Title 23, which is motor vehicles. Usually that's upstairs, uh, well, upstairs, not, but in the building upstairs and transportation. And, um, but sometimes like things like DUI, you guys work on those because there's criminal implications. Um, sometimes you're in Title 28, which is corrections. Um, so there's some overlap because with corrections, you have something like, you know, you have things like probation. Probation is court imposed as opposed to like furlough, which is DOC imposed. So you guys will deal with things involving the courts and corrections. And then Title 33 is human services. Um, and that you have uh, the chins cases, you have delinquency, um, you have those types of things, child abuse and neglect. 
and so you'll work in 33. And then there's also 18, which is the health title and the regulated drugs. So the uh, illegal drugs, uh, that's in title 18 in the health chapter. So, so judiciary has works in more titles and covers more things than really any other, any other committee. Um, so. Yep. Great, that, that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Great. Yeah. Tom. Yes, thank you. I just want to skip back a little bit, Michelle. What I think I heard you say is that sometime intent goes into session law. Yeah, yep. Okay, and so not legal terms by any means. I mean, session law comes to an end. Um, the way I the way I put it, uh, at some point I don't know I, I don't know if it's the end of the year or the end of the session, whatever the date is. So in, in a situation where there's uh, I guess some deliberation going on, they would still go back and look at that intent, even though the uh, um, the session law has come to an end. Session law doesn't come to an end. Oh, oh, I thought. <laughs> I guess I'm under the impression that session law uh, um, is only good for a period of time. No. Okay. No, I mean, we use it when things are time limited, like a study committee, you know, or an appropriation, things like that. Okay. But, um, it's not like it comes to an end unless you have language there that says it now ends. So like with study committees, it'll say, and this committee shall no longer exist as of this date or whatever. But um, it's more, they're more like guiding, guiding documents. And when we're talking about intent, I just want to make sure that I'm clear is that I'm talking about, you know, a statement from y'all around the intent of, of the act and the specific language, as opposed to what we we're talking about with Marshall and David, which is your mental state, your intent with regard to the act that subjected you to the criminal charge. That's, right, a, yeah, yeah. that's a separate issue. Yes, yeah. Right. Tom, okay. I wonder, are you, were you thinking about sunsets? No, I, I guess I, I would, I just misinterpreted what, what session law was. I, I was just thinking that, you know, we, <laughs> We kind of needed to do something for a year, but or whatever the period of time, and after that period of time, it wasn't needed anymore. Uh, if that's an explanation, but um, yeah, I, I guess I have a whole new whole new view on what the definition of session law is. Thank you. I'm gonna here. I'm gonna look up and give you an example. Uh, um. So if I go and I look at, this is a, I think a good example. If I look at the civil unions law, right? We don't even have civil unions. I mean, people, people still have civil unions, but it's not like you now go, you know, can establish a civil union or whatever. But at the time, you know, um, so there's still the, the statutory scheme is still on the books, even though people can't now enter uh, civil unions, but people still are out there who have civil unions. Um, and there was a, as you can imagine with something like this, uh, responding to the Baker case and uh, it being a very uh, charged issue it is um, there we put in a purpose and we also put in legislative findings. Um, I also apparently added a severability clause. <laughs> Um, for belts and suspenders, so people would be clear on that. Um, but that is all in the history note, and I don't know if people can kind of, can you see that at all <laughs> on there? Is that's a history note under there, and it lists okay. all of that. So that's helpful, you know, to have in there, but it's not, there's no real, uh, it's just kind of y'all giving some context for the statutory language that you've adopted. So it's still good, it's valid, it's there for people to see. It's one of the nice things about using the books instead of online because those notes are not online. 
Um, you know, it gives you and it tells you like where you can go find it and pull up the act and take a look at it, but it's still there. I mean, it, it, if you didn't want it there any longer, you would have to repeal it just like you repeal uh, a, statu a statue. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, whenever you need to go. Sure, no, I, um, I just have my plumbers here, but it sounds like he let himself in. <laughs> so it's all good. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, and we're adjourning at 11.45 anyway, but I see two hands, I see Kate and then Ken. Sure. Thank you. So I'm um, still, still trying to get a little bit of clarity around. So when you were, I think you said Title 13 was crim criminal mm -hmm. law. So when we're talking about, we were talking about a preamble for criminal code or penal code, is that, a, is that a separate thing or is that related to like that section of law that you're describing? You know, I didn't, I wasn't really keyed into your discussion on the, on the criminal code. I think what you guys were doing is kind of setting up the intro for why you're doing what you're doing. And I don't know what Eric is calling it or if it's purpose or intent or whatever, but um, you know, that it'll be, you know, that might be something with adopting a whole new thing that you might want to, that you would probably want to codify um, but it is part of it, and it would go into Title 13 with the changes. Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure I'll have many more, but I think for now, yeah. answers. And feel free to shoot me emails or, or whatever, so. Uh, Ken. So, so, Michelle, so the civil unions is in the Green Book, and I assume it goes in the green book when it becomes law and how it became law or whatever. So you fall back on that's where it is. Is that, is that part correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. And now, because you're saying now with civil unions really aren't, um, you didn't say this, but in my mind, it's like, it doesn't matter anymore because it's just a, uh, recognized as a marriage or whatever, it's not really even followed. It doesn't need to be followed, correct? Well, it does in the sense that, uh, so when we did marriage equality in, tw in 2009, there was a, uh, you know, there was a deci policy decision that, um, that to, to still leave civil unions on the books, not to repeal civil unions. Some states, you know, were looking at, like I think Connecticut, it was like, it, kind of turned your civil union into a marriage and converted it and then they adopted marriage equality. But at the time, um, advocates, uh, they said, well, some people really like it being civil unions. They wanna hold on to their civil union and they're not really interested in marriage because that doesn't fit for them or for whatever. So the, the and so, or they said, because at the time, and this is before the US Supreme Court had weighed in on the issue and states had very differing, had very different ways that they would approach this. So some states would recognize um, uh, same-sex couples and civil, civil unions, but they wouldn't recognize marriage. It was just kind of all over the place. And so there were a lot of couples who at the time when, when this was still percolating through the courts, that said, well, we have a civil union, now we're gonna get married, but we wanna have both because that affords us the greatest protection when we're traveling, especially if they have kids. And so there were folks who had both, but when we did marriage equality, we created a, a mechanism where if you had a civil union and, you, and you're like, yeah, that was like second class, I wanted to be out of that and I wanna be married, that you could upon getting married, you could just automatically dissolve your civil union. So it's important that these laws are still there because there's still people out there who have civil unions. And so it, it's important that this law stays on the books that so that you can see that what the rights are if you're, if you're in a civil union. So even though you can't get a civil union now, um, the law is still there. It wasn't repealed when we did marriage the history of, of how it all happened and now it's marriage, it's called marriage equality? It's just marriage, everybody can get married. Yeah, beautiful, <laughs> someday I will, I'll wait I am. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, Kate. Okay. Sorry, I left my hand nice up. Your hands up. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Ken, do you have another comment or question? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That was that was helpful. And uh, Martin has sent us um, preamble, right, to I haven't looked at it, but something um, related to what we're talking about preamble to a uh, model penal code could be helpful. And um, Selena, I'll touch base with you over the weekend or early in the week to be thinking about how to formulate our, hey. our visioning session. And anybody else um, too, you want to reach out to me or um, just think about how to how to do this. But I think it'd be great to really start start from the beginning. A new committee do review what um, what Mike has sent us in terms of what we this committee has done in the past. Uh, but definitely start anew is, is what I would like to do. Um, we, have, we still have a few more minutes before we adjourn. Any questions about next week or anything else? Um, Kate. Thank you. Um, just another clarifying question. So um, looking at what Mike said, and then are you all going to be touching base about to sort of give some direction in terms of some like grounding questions that we might be thinking about, or is that is that something we sort of define that? It's helpful for me if I have sort of like a, a specific question or thing that I'm brainstorming around. Yeah, so I'm open to um, to what those questions could be. So, and if um, if you want to work with Selena or reach out to me, it, it's really um, I want this to come from from everybody in kind of an organic process. So it'd be great to have your thoughts on on what some of those questions would be. Does that does that answer your question? Or or were you looking for more specific, you know, this is what we're going to be doing. This is what we're going to be answering or Yeah, however, I think just looking for some clarity around how you wanted to manage it if you were going to pass down questions or it sounds like it's a more sort of like organic team process. So I'm happy to shoot out like how I might be thinking about the the broader question that you're bringing up and I can email those to you all. Yeah, that, that would be great. And actually, if you and Selena want to be a little study committee or something, <laughs> subcommittee <laughs> or subcommittee. Um, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Sounds great, thank you. Anybody else? All right, well, great. Well, thank you everybody, have a restful weekend and be safe and healthy and thank you mike i don't i don't see but i know you're on thank you so much for for helping us out and for the week and i will look out for the um for the agenda for the draft agenda and um monday is a holiday so um so legislative council does have does have the day off um but we will get you an agenda as soon as as soon as possible but um Tuesdays, um, as usual, we're on the floor at 10, uh, caucuses and lunch. So general rule for Tuesday is committee at 1.15. Okay, and then Wednesday and Thursday, the general rule is 15 minutes after the floor um, in the afternoon, but mornings on Wednesdays and Thursdays is at nine. And then Friday again, 15 minutes after the floor. There will be some Friday um, afternoons where we will be meeting, but not until 1.15 because of caucuses and tax workshops and very various other things going on. Um, um, I think the date for the budget was just set or we'll decide on that, but there will be times where we'll have joint sessions and other things will come in um, that we'll need to work around. So, all right, anything else before we adjourn? Or